Um, I'm not going to ask the speakers to do intros or such since you've already, already met them. Um, we'll just get underway in just a second. And a reminder, if you do have quite for the folks on, online, if you do have questions, uh, just make sure you um, click click on the Slido link at the bottom and enter them in, and then they'll pop up here so we can uh, we can get to them. Um, so what I'm going to ask, the, ask this group to do is to start out two, three sentences or that kind of length, um, identify what you think are the highest priority research and policy needs. You know, basically looking at the interconnection um, of, of, of tech, technical R&D, but also policy R&D, um, where you think the biggest, uh, the biggest gaps are, the biggest needs. And I'm going to start with Jennifer. Sure, I wanted to emphasize a point that came up today, which was about the scales and the idea that you not only need lithium within brines, but you also need to produce enough fluids. So I just wanted to reemphasize that I think that we need research in the area of the amount of water that can be produced from these reservoirs, because not every lithium reservoir will have high lithium concentrations. And some of these reservoirs, like we heard about the shales, the Unconventional reservoirs will have low permeability, and it's actually permeability that's varying over the most magnitude, say over five orders of magnitude, versus lithium concentration, which has lower variability. And to talk about scales in terms of if we were to scale this up from sedimentary basins or oil fields, we're talking about producing lithium to match global production. And that's really on par with the amount of water that's been produced with oil and gas over the last hundred years. So I think that aspect of scale needs to be an important part of the conversation. And again, permeability and how much fluids can be produced. Great. Scott. Uh, yeah, I would just say first off that um, the framework here of brine types and deposits that we've talked about um, when I started doing this work, it didn't wasn't quite so coherent. So I think that's a major advance. Um, and then, you know, some of the things related to research, you know, in closed basins is pretty easy. You know, nobody really wants to count reagents or product or monitor water. It's just expensive and not scientifically interesting. But in a closed basin, it, you know, the only thing that leaves is water by evaporation. And, and it's a really excellent opportunity to understand the cumulative impacts of, of things. Um, and then the other, I guess, final comments I would make are sort of related to in situ sort of leaching and, you know, sort of research boreholes and pumping tests and injection and, you know, kind of expensive things that would answer some of the questions about how reactive are the aquifer materials, what types of enhanced production, you know, would work in certain reservoirs. Um, and then, you know, I was really happy to hear about the work that Tom's doing, but I think one of the issues with, with DLE that, that we need to understand and where more public research needs to be done is, is a lot of that research is done with the hopes of licensing technology um, so people are going after deposits just because of the technology and the deposit itself may never pay off, but if you can license the technology, there's an economic advantage. And so it was really nice to hear about Tom's consortium and, and how they're approaching that. Great, thanks. Sylvie. I think the main um, thing that comes up for me are, is the need for field-based surveys for species um, in order to understand impacts, we need to know what's there. And there are many locations that have not been well surveyed, not been botanized at all. No one ever has been on the ground to look at them. Uh, there are no records available or very, or very, very few. And there are big taxonomic biases in those records. So being able to get comprehensive data or any data on the ground for what species are present um, is probably one of the major uh, recommendations that I would make for, for understanding impacts. And then in addition to that, being able to use those data to conduct some habitat suitability modeling to be able to understand how big of an impact of a total species range would any one particular project site or extraction um, impact. So if, if there are some species that that their entire range is covered by 
a project site. There are other species that are very wide ranging um, where that's not the case. And so understanding those differences is key. And then, then additionally, cumulative impacts analysis, as I mentioned during my talk, particularly when it comes to thinking about wildlife that use wetland resources across their range and have multiple stopping points on a migration route, for instance, being able to understand um, changes that could occur due to lithium extraction and how that could influence their ability to complete their life cycle and complete their migration. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have two um, items. One is related to the supply chain. And um, my recommendation is that we need to think further up the supply chain than we have been. Um, and what that means is exploration and discovery and characterization of the, the ore deposits. So if we just take lithium in the United States, for example, we really don't understand um, how much we have, where it is, um, you know, there's so, I think a lot of focus I've seen is, has been on the downstream where it's like, okay, are you making a battery? And with respect to other elements, are you, you know, are you um, making magnets, whatever it is, like sort of that, what are the products coming out? But there's a lot of work that needs to be done before we get there. The second is around water. Um, like, so we're hearing this water theme a lot, but um, water resources, use, availability. Um, what are the basin scale? And one thing I, I like to call a mega watershed is not just looking at individual watersheds, but looking at regions. So, you know, maybe you could think of like the Great Basin, right, as one. Um, the Puna Plateau in South America. So what are the connections between the fresh, the brackish, waters and the brines. I think those are the important pieces. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, got three things. One is we, you know, a lot of these uh, studies have shown the resources are there, but we just don't know if the technology is in place to economically be able to recover the, the lithium from the different brines. I think so just seeing will DLE work at a commercial scale. Um, reiterating what Leanne just said, water is critical for all these things. Uh, for the Salton Sea, you're in, a, in an area where you have restricted availability of water and, and figuring out how to balance the water needs of the community and how it impacts the environment is really important, how you can re reuse water and recycle water in different ways. And then the third thing is resource management. There are multiple companies that are going after a single resource in the subsurface. And there may need to be policy changes to ensure that the companies optimally utilize this resource. Uh, the, you have these artificial lease boundaries, but the resource doesn't really see them underground. And so how do you make sure that that when you have different companies putting their straw into the same resource that you're you're doing utilization in, a, in a, an efficient and optimal way? Okay, um, I'll talk about one research need I think is important. Um, I think finding this middle ground between um, any of these new critical mineral recovery technologies and um, what sort of um, real world samples are going are gonna to go into that. Um, a lot of these are developed using idealized compositions with lithium in it. And the big question is when you start including, for example, oil and gas brines, when there's oil and gas in there and other or organics, when there's other components in there, um, what is that actually going to do to the um, lithium or other commodity recovery. Yeah, Simon. I think um, understanding some of the uncertainties around the lithium sector. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, I talked a little bit about supply and demand and, and Leanne mentioned a, a little bit briefly there, but just to work out what we have in the ground, what's likely to be needed and what that kind of relative timing is, because we can talk about all these uh, exciting developments, but you know the fact is, if a, a lithium project is never going to be economic or is only going to be under econo uneconomic under certain circumstances, we need to know what those circumstances are and factor that into actually working out what our domestic supply situation is going to be, and that includes environmental and social challenges because they're the biggest challenges the minerals industry faces right now, including brine development. And if we don't understand the, the potential impact of those on, on lithium supply, then uh, uh, I, I don't think we have a full picture. Um, I 
two items. Thanks, Doug. Um, from a technology standpoint, I think the a, a area for research is improving selectivity. Um, the more we can be selective or target the particular element um, that we wish to extract from whatever that resource is, for whatever element, the benefits are are multi multifold. Um, one, um, we get quicker to we get a higher efficiency of recovery. So we need less stages. We need less water. We need less land print, land footprint, less capital expense, less operating expense. So the, reducing the number of steps through more efficient and selective separation processes is, is clearly um, a, a fundamental need. Um, second um, point is more technical or technological, and that's we need technologies that have maybe a versatility of application. Um, as we've heard throughout today, the sources are wide and varied. If we can develop technology that can be utilized um, uh, for multiple different sources, um, multiple different brines, but hey, if if it works and it works on tailings um, to get the lithium, I mean, it that would be great. Those are my two points. Okay, great. And then I'm sure I'm going to start sort of going backwards because with all these R&D needs that you identified either earlier in the day or right now, um, can you compare the the needs or the collective needs with that funding landscape? You know, you know, funding coming from either NSF or from DOE or other or other agencies. Um, how, without a number, how big is that gap? Um, So right now I see I see the gap as being in kind of the mid stage of development. Um, we do really well in discovery science and getting things to lab scale and even maybe bench scale. And to jump right to pilot scale is is frankly too big of a jump. Um, I think we need test bed facilities. Um, Department of Energy is beginning to provide some investments in this area. Um, really to your point, does the technology work at scale? Um, but to invest uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars in a pilot scale activity um, before it's really validated and an Im intermediate somewhere between bench and pilot seems like we're we're jumping too fast. Simon, um, difficult question to answer, but uh, I think. Uh, <sighs> I think what we need to do is we need to actually look at the science and research that we're doing and work out what's impactful. I mean, we can all do good science, but what we need is actually impactful science that will specifically change things that like advancing direct lithium extraction or understanding, uh, you know, uh, more about brine systems so we can actually apply that knowledge and, and extract things in a more environmentally or sustainable way. So actually thinking about the research we do and working out, or even just looking at the research we've done already and seeing what's impactful and what hasn't been so impactful and learning for that and developing directed funding solutions, maybe one way forward. It's just a, a thought. Um, I work for the US Geological Survey, so we're not a funding agency, so it's a little bit different, nor are we regularly you know, trying to get funding. But I think it is important to note that a lot of these fundamental questions are things that the USGS is set up to um, look at on a large scale with teams of assessment geologists and, and whatnot. So um, if there are those sort of basic, not necessarily technological questions, but these sorts of things that you know, the information that, that you need to be able to scale up and build, um, these are the sorts of things that, you know, the USGS and higher levels within the USGS can organize to get funding to do. Pat, and then I'm going to switch questions to the next one. Okay. So I would say that, you know, at the national lab, we've been fortunate to get DOE funding and uh, California Energy Commission funding for, for some of the projects we've been doing on this research. I would say one challenge is not necessarily funding, it's data. And some of the companies that are involved in this are very secretive and don't share information. And so being able to build models really depends on having useful information and i think that's that's a critical challenge you can have all the money you want but if you can't 
get the information you need, it makes it hard to do the, the good job. Okay, and I'm going to switch questions a little bit. Um, you know, Tom mentioned um, test facilities, test, test capabilities, pilots and such. Um, and Simon had talked about sort of the gaps between, um, you know, the, both, both the price deck and how that's going up and down, but also the scenario of one year having oversupply, the next year having a significant undersupply as, this, as the demand curve uh, goes up. Um, could you talk about um, how a something that like Tom, Tom was talking about a, a an organized um, test facility, you know, a significant test facility to test lots of brines against lots of DLE technologies, how that might sort of either um, muddy the waters or accelerate science and learning. I'm just going to go start with Leanne. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that. I would like to point out that um, lithium brines, um, for example, uh, <laughs> we don't know that much about them, right? Like compared to gold, silver, copper. Um, there have been ore deposit models around for those um, other uh, metals for um, hundreds of years. So we're trying to accelerate something um, that we we just haven't really been working on for a long time. And I think it's going to take a, a new approach. It's going to take multi-agencies, multi-universities, researchers coming together in a in a very big effort. And I I don't think it, I mean, there might be some mud in that water, <laughs> but um, that's what we have to do, right? If we want to do this quickly and, and innovate and accelerate, so that's sort of my vision of, of how we could get together and, you know, work towards these goals of increasing domestic supply, relying less on uh, foreign supply chain. And, and then Sophie, your areas that you talked about um, are a little bit different. Um, so how could there be a more organized the basically the equivalent of a test facility for the kinds of topics that you were bringing up. Yeah, thank you. I think that the information that we have about species and natural systems is largely contained in our uh, natural diversity databases at the state level. And those are funded by the states in a variety of different fashions at different levels. There's no unified um, federal level national biological survey entity. And so the information is really state by state. And then there are a variety of uh, other entities, nonprofit organizations, uh, academic institutions, museums participating in gathering that information. If we had a particular topic that we could organize around and identify the landscapes of interest and have funding to be able to address that, um, that would probably be beneficial. And then just to draw on that really quickly, could you talk about how that would and tie into this broader topic that's been brought up a couple of times of um, community and social understanding or acceptance of, of the mineral sector more broadly? Yeah, I think that's a, a really, um, important point to bring up. And I think there's also, uh, in addition to that, tribal issues related to this topic that I think um, re require serious thought and consideration. Um, a multi-stakeholder, multi-interested um, group organized around, around this topic could be helpful. Um, folks that represent how, how do we, how do we, uh, bring the biological and environmental information to bear. In addition to how do we incorporate that, that information, um, the information that already exists, how do we gather more? And then how do we uh, work with communities to, to make these approaches something that, that communities are gonna be willing to accept and, um, and want to support? I think, there's, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Great. Scott, a different kind of question for you. A lot of the talk here is on, um, has been on 
how many, how much activity there is. I can't, I can't remember if it's 57 or 72 projects in Nevada alone um, that, um, that I think Simon had mentioned. Um, uh, but can you talk about how I think, you know, that this R&D can then help also help identify the places to not go as opposed to the places to go? You know, in other words, um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, there's a technical uh, slice there. There's an economic slice. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, well, you know, I would say for a long time, for example, on Great Salt Lake, there have been four different mineral operators sharing a resource and operating simultaneously. Um, and that's a best case scenario, right? You don't have to pump it up. It's floating around at the surface, right? So lift is one thing. The shallower you are, the, the more accessible things are in terms of energy. Um, and then, you know, I, th I think, you know, the magnesium is a thing, you know, for lithium and, and Sophie, everyone's mentioned this, but, but I think it's, it's important to recognize that it's not just for DLE. It's also interferes with your extraction process in ponds. So the exact same thing. And so I, you know, I don't know, identifying the challenge in chemistries, but I think, um, honestly, if you looked at the Western US and you thought about it, um, there would be what's the brine chemistry what am i trying to get out of it and then your immediate next question is how much water is it going to take and how much water is available right because there are some places where you can't take any water out of the ground at all i mean it's it's a non-starter um and, and you know i think that's one of the the challenges here is identifying places with available water resources i think would be a, a really critical overlay to some of that Jennifer, sort of on that same theme. Yeah, I think Bex, the water had a comment about that. It really depends on the system. For these closed basins, we saw that the groundwater is circulating on shorter time scales and that it's part of an active groundwater flow system. Within sedimentary basins, we're talking about producing very old brine with the oil and gas. And in so that case, you'd want to go to a place where there isn't recent meteoric recharge because the lithium will be too low. Um, maybe there's a water issue with, you know, production of lithium at the surface, the extraction of the lithium. And like enhanced oil recovery, you know, they do add near surface water to enhance the pressure within reservoirs once you extract the fluids. But I just wanted to make that point that, you know, that water footprint is very different from oil field brines than it is from closed basins. Um, I also just wanted to return to, in my mind, one of the gaps in basic research needs, which is knowing the lithium sources. So I think you heard today that we often wave our arms about lithium might be coming from volcanic materials or it might be coming from clays, but I think that we really don't know. And that's where a lot of basic um, science research needs to head, both from the rock and the brine side. And that's a good... Um... That's a good segue into one of the questions from online here. Um, the question is, where is the where is the research on reducing the risk of brine exploration? Um, uh, in other words, it, you know, funding well, funding wells or um, funding drilling and testing data that then is immediately open source so it's available. Um, so, is there any re is, you know, the research I guess that reduces risk of exploration? More, you know, fund, fundamentally, this is not just a lithium question. I, you know, this is this is pretty much every metal, but it's a good lithium question too. I'd say uh, a couple things quickly, Doug. Um, one is basin scale geophysics, right? Because if you go down somewhere, you want to know: Am I dealing with one aquifer or five aquifers, or you know, how many reservoirs are there? Um, and and that's very difficult to do by drilling. It's really great snapshot, you know, aerial geophysics or other things. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is the state of Nevada now has a brine exploration program, which they permit and you have uh, an extraction well and I think a reinjection well, and you have to put meters on both of them and they, they lower basically, and they're fairly easy to get. Um, and you can do whatever you extract, what you need, you know, assess the, how the aquifer performs, what's in it. Um, and then you basically, if you don't do anything with it, you have to plug it 
in something like three or six months and it's done. But they, they've they've kind of come up with a way for people to to go in, you know, quickly and cheaply and rapidly assess what's there and then basically seal it up and then they keep a public database of those activities. You have another question, Jennifer, or another I, comment? I was just going to add to that in terms of reducing uncertainty or risk. I mean, I think we've presented today that there are certain fingerprints that you could look at that would show you is there a higher or lower probability. Our data is very few and far between with lithium, but also other commodities that might be produced. So helium, hydrogen, things like that. And so some of these deep brine systems may also be places where you could find these other resources. And so not just measuring lithium and major ions, but gases and things that might also be an additional resource. Which, which would mean the funding to make sure that all that data is collected too. Okay. I've got a question now for pretty much for everybody or for anybody. Um, uh, we're talking about lithium brines, but the funding sources or the R&D funding sources don't organize necessarily that way. They fund, they, they organize either around other commodities. Um, uh, in, in the case of of the Critical Materials Institute that Tom has responsibility for. It's around an institute, um, you know, topics within an institute, or um, or it's central. In Madeline's case, it's central to what the USGS is doing. Is that does that make this easier or harder to try to drive R and D that basically is crossing every one of these boundaries? Um, I'm just curious if anybody has a if you can just raise a card so I can just see, Leanne. I didn't even get my card up. Thanks. <laughs> um, so I would, I'm just going to speak from my personal sort of long-term experience working around the lithium industry. And where I've learned the most is going multiple times to the sites, doing the field work, interacting with the industry, the people who are doing the work. And that, um, that's something that that takes time and you have to gain the trust um, of companies. But I think that if we could bring together like an industry consortium, like an example is, you know, oil and gas industry has done this. If we could bring together a consortium of the industry people with, and this is kind of getting to my multi-faceted um, <laughs> work group, um, I think that that would help us accelerate and move in the in the right direction. Tom. With the chance of touting my own institute, um, I think the consortium model that that CMI has been able to to um, employ actually addresses what you've characterized as kind of the boundaries in between all of these issues, right? Um, so our approach, um, while we may be focused on, you know, developing assortment, we are interacting with the, the economic modelers and the life cycle uh, analysis um, teams to be able to understand the impact of that technology. And I get that we are at a early stage applied research stage. Um, I don't know how that scales and we'll talk about scaling. Um, once you get closer to actual you know, demonstration plants and, and more industry driven, I don't know how you develop a consortium. Um, but there has been um, other consortiums in other industries where you can identify the pre competitive issues that the industry is facing and and work effectively to overcome that. So um, it's not a singular problem. It's more than just a, a, a really keen researcher being very creative in their laboratory. It's really about trying to assess that technology as it impacts not just the stages of the supply chain preceding and downstream, but to also bring in all of these other factors that we've been talking about from from the ESG 
the techno-economic, all of that I think is important in developing supply chains. Thanks, Tom. Scott and then Simon. Um, you know, I think one of the challenges, right, coordinating across scientific fields, institutions, organizations, administrations, right? And so I think one of the things that I see having retraced the footsteps of people doing this work for the USGS in the 70s is um, in terms of, you know, funding and support, right? Everyone's got their strength and what they can bring to the table. But how do you maintain, one, how do you coordinate, but two, how do you maintain it long term, right? You know, it's like, yeah, sure, we can have some funding. It's like, a you know, fire in the walk when it's gone. Um, and how do you maybe spread that out over 10 years and maintain a focus in terms of, you know, a coordinated vision and what's actually making a difference. And to me, that's kind of the challenge. Things become a bit disjointed when it's like, well, I did this and someone did that. And, and the coordination, if, if there would be a way to establish more of a longer term view and commitment, I know we all want it yesterday, but I think we've demonstrated that's not gonna happen. Simon. I think um, industry kind of downstream is is pretty good at kind of consortium approaches. We've seen things in Nevada where, you know, battery manufacturers and, and some exploration groups are getting together to work with the university and, and put in like a NSF engines bids and so on. But um, I think one area we could maybe learn from is Australia where, you know, the Amira consortium model, but basically you know, a, a group organizes a consortium around a specific problem or a specific mineral deposit, in which case, you know, what we have here is a, a whole load of lithium brines that we could actually benefit from, from learning a lot more about and learning how to process. But there's also a lot of commonalities here that uh, that something like a, a consortium approach could well work together. And, and I think there's there's things to learn from from other areas where they where they have these sorts of approaches to solve exactly these sorts of problems. If anybody's not familiar with Amira, they basically coordinate groups of industry funders along with um, uh, university researchers to work together to have projects that can often have multiple iterations. Like they've been working in mineral processing on a on a project version A, B, C, D, E since the 1960s and so on. So it's a it's a really effective approach, but it also kind of gets over some of those confidentiality uh, issues that others have uh, have mentioned here. If you get a group together to work on specific problems, you can uh, you can overcome some of those issues. Well, that's help. That's really really helpful. A um, couple more questions, and I think we're going to move on. Um, this is a timely topic, um, witnessed by the number of people here and the number of folks who are online. Um, can you speak in an R and D context? Can you speak to the urgency of the R and D challenges? We just take our time. We figure this out in you know 10, 15 years. Is that is that pretty good, or is this? Oh, we have to get after it now. Um, and uh, Sophie, I don't think I have to remind anyone that uh, extinction is forever. And so, when it comes to thinking about the biological resources and the imperative to make sure that our actions protect them. Uh, we need to know what's there in order to be able to protect it. So there is some urgency in being able to define what species are present in particular locations uh, and to, to, to be able to have a plan uh, to prevent for their, instinct, uh, their extinction. So there is that. I think that that is complicated by the challenge of our mining law as it applies to public lands. Uh, whereas for other activities, we can do programmatic environmental impact statements, such as we're done for uh, renewable energy throughout the West. Um, but for this activity, it becomes more difficult to do that type of assessment, that type of analysis, and, and look at things more broadly across a region. Um, so, to, yeah, I'll stop there. Uh um, I would say, given the, the, the trajectory of trying to decarbonize you know, all aspects of our economy and of our society, and especially in California with the timetable that's set there, 
this is really an urgent issue. The fact that we need these materials to do the decarbonization, to electrify uh, our vehicles and to have battery storage. So there's the, the, the challenge is to do this right, I guess, and to not end up with these green energy sacrifice zones. So figuring out how we assess what the environmental and social risks are before we go forward, I think is really important. And, and so how do we come up with a template to, to do it right, I think is a, is a key challenge. Thanks, Pat. Simon, you had another one and then I'll go to Scott. Yeah, I think um, I just want to echo what Pat says and, and what Sophie mentioned. That, you know, this this is how the energy transition is essentially happening right now. We are going to see increased demand for all sorts of metals, and lithium is a key one of them. And um, unless we work out how we can actually extract lithium in an environmentally and socially acceptable manner, to uh, then you know we we're, we're going to end up in a situation where we've got an awful lot of development happening downstream, an awful lot of lithium demand, but we have no supply. And that means we're either beholden on insecure supply from elsewhere or a whole load of manufacturing isn't going to happen and that's going to have significant impacts for climate change, for the US economy and more. So I think it, it, it is urgent. We need to we need to not only do the R&D, we need to understand what the uncertainties are around or all of this are, just in case, you know, what, what happens if a project succeeds, if a project fails, what the implications are on all of that and how do we fit in the global sector as well? We're talking about domestic resources, which are crucial, but we're also part of a, a globalized economy. And we need to understand what other countries are doing as well. Scott. So basically what, what Pat and Simon said, I was going to say there's two prongs, right? There's the energy transition. That's urgent. But then there's the criticality issue, right? Which is, um, and the importance part of the critical is what does it mean to our industry or our economy domestically. And I can tell you from working internationally in this issue for a long time and with many international colleagues, the EU and China both view this as an urgent issue. Um, and so in a geopolitical context, um, you'd have to wonder if we're missing something if we don't consider it urgent. Which actually tees up the the last question, and then we'll then we'll then we'll finish up here. Um, you know, the, the question there's a question here online. It's, it's um, you know how does RR the the U.S. centric R and D and uh, brines and the, all these all the related topics, how does this compare to the comparable R and D or efforts that might be going on elsewhere in the world? You know whether it's EU, China, other parts of the or South America, other parts of the world. Um, are we leading the pack? Are we sort of, you know, where where is the U.S. in terms of its R and D in these, in this broad set of topics you all have mentioned? Yeah. So I can speak, um, you know, within my research realm, um, South America and the opportunities there have that have been presented um, to to work on projects. Um, so my research team work that Scott is doing within the USGS um, has, and collaboratively with um, our international um, other academics, researchers um, in the industry, there's a, a lot of knowledge that's been gained there. Um, some other, and I'm just I'm just going to focus on closed base and brines because it's such an open big question. But there's other places in the world that it's hard to know about um, because there's not a lot of public information. But um, you know, the the United States um, it has you know now in these emerging lithium brines, which are the low temperature geothermal and the high temperature geothermal, and um, there's a lot of opportunity there to to expand what we already, you know, sort of know about these places because of geothermal activity, oil and gas development. And, you know, that that should really be capitalized on. And Pat. Um, in Europe, there's quite a bit of activity looking at geothermal brines as a source of lithium. A number of startup companies, Vulcan and Lithium de France are, are two 
uh, such entities. There's EU funding for this work. Uh, BRGM, sort of the USGS of, of, of France, has been doing lithium research, and they just published an atlas on geothermal resources of Europe this past couple of months. So it's so a lot of activity and a lot of potential for collaboration between uh, researchers there and here in the U.S. Thanks, Pat. Okay, we are going to move on. Um, we're now going to have some um, closing presentations by um, basically the federal funding agencies um, about you know current or available or oncoming uh, research opportunities. And the first uh, speaker is uh, Hikam uh, Hajeras. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. By the way, Hikam is the program manager with. Uh, um, the uh, uh, fossil energy and uh, carbon carbon management office at DOE. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Hisham Majeris, and I'm the program manager for the water management R&D program at the Department of Energy's Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. It's a pleasure being with you all this afternoon, um, and I will give a brief overview of the program. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so all water-related R&D within the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management is managed by our program, which is housed in the Advanced Remediation Technologies Division. Now, historically, uh, water management was split across two programs um, across um, uh, different offices within FECM. The first, uh, it was primarily focused on water management for power systems, um, which shifted from power plant water research um, and active water management operations to remediating coal power waste. The other program was the produced water management program, which has become a significant focus uh, for FECM. Uh, this program is primarily fo uh, uh, is primarily focused on the characterization, treatment, and and management of water produced during oil and gas operations. Um, and we're looking at produced water across the country, across uh, different basins of varying uh, salinities and chemical compositions. Uh, now, both programs are under uh, the singular um, water management uh, R&D program. Um, a common denominator across both of these programs is the um, focus on water recycling and beneficial reuse outside of oil and gas operations and outside of um, uh, uh, general energy management operations, um, especially when it comes to the benefit, especially when it comes to beneficial reuse of um, uh, for industry, agriculture, specifically non-edible crops. Um, and the other objective is the recovery of critical minerals, rare earths, and other beneficial resources from these waste streams. Uh, these not only have the um, benefit of furthering the uh, technological state of the art for water treatment technologies, but also um, help lower the costs uh, of water management um, uh, and enable the beneficial use to take place. Next slide, please. And uh, here's the geographical distribution of our program. Since 2018, we have funded projects across 23 states. As you can see, the, um, a lot of the uh, projects are in the oil and gas and coal producing regions of our nation. Uh, many of the projects that you see in the South Southwest, especially in the Permian, um, are relatively recent, um, show, which shows the uh, uh, shift towards produced water management. Next slide, please. Uh, now, I mentioned that um, we reorganized both programs into uh, a single program, and as part of this, we decided to take advantage of the synergies and interoperability between various projects to develop a system to help facilitate future R&D as, well as, uh, as well as optimize ex existing R&D. We have four primary R&D areas. Some of these we've always had, such as the advanced human processes and systems analyses, but others such as AI and big data, as well as biological and chemical characterization, are relatively uh, newcomers. Um, and we uh, took a platform development tool, so we're no longer focusing on just specific projects, but um, uh, platforms, especially on the digital side, that um, can be built over time, especially when it comes to data, when it comes to decision-making tools. Uh, we have actually three um, major efforts on the data side. One of them is the National uh, Energy Water Treatment and Speciation Database, NUTS for short. I highly recommend um, uh, looking this up online. You can upload data or access data 
Um, so we're in the process of not only collecting and curating data in partnership with other organizations, other agencies, uh, but also um, uh, generating synthetic data um, using um, uh, using advanced neural networks um, to help address data gaps. Um, and the goal of this is to help feed in um, high quality data that um, any modeling uh, uh, that that your uh, typical modeling tools can use with uh, with relative ease. Um, and we're also doing chemical and biological characterization. Uh, this includes um, collecting uh, previous samples, um, uh, samples from our own projects and samples from partner institutions, which again, we upload uh, to the database. Um, and, you know, overall, some of the programs we funded not only have the benefit for the original scope of work, but they also support, serve as a platform to support new ones as well. Uh, this helps us um, avoid reinventing the wheel and lowers the cost significantly um, for testing new technologies. Uh, for example, we've had the brine extraction storage and test site in North Dakota, which I will go into detail in the coming slides. Um, this uh, project was initially intended for carbon capture storage brines, but um, with the capital investment we put in and with the fact that um, we could treat um, highly saline brines um, in excess of 200,000 milligrams per liter, uh, we realized that we could um, use this as a test bed for different types of technologies uh, with uh, from different types of waste streams. Um, and so that was the case for BEST. Um, and we were able to um, test different technologies beyond the original scope, um, including for produced water as well as power plants. And it also has the potential uh, for critical mineral recovery as well. Um, to date, on top of the original um, uh, technologies uh, for which the best site was intended for. We tested four additional pilot scale technologies, uh, which I will also go into detail in the coming slides. Um, but yes, overall, we're, we're taking this platform approach, building off of existing research. Um, and, this, and this is especially significant when it comes to data. Um, next slide, please. Now, as far as uh, the um, how, how uh, the, our different research uh, priorities, uh, we have a, a, a number of areas that we're looking at, uh, as well as a number of mechanisms with which we uh, pursue and support this research. Many of you have heard about um, the typical uh, funding opportunity announcements, as well as SBIRs. Uh, we're active in those, and um, we also uh, relatively recently launched this new initiative called the Produced Water Research Partnership, which allows us to work directly uh, with uh, universities on critical produced water management issues. Um, the focus historic, uh, the focus currently and the projects are ongoing has been on the beneficial reuse of produced water. And really, um, th th this ties in very well with produced water characterization treatment. It's really all of it is about understanding the known unknowns, um, the chemical and biological composition of the water. Um, and this has implications beyond uh, just treatment, but also uh, the beneficial reuse, um, uh, it, the beneficial reuse, especially when it comes to toxicological um, and health impacts, um, as well as the critical mineral recovery potential. Essentially, understanding what's in the water allows us to not only adjust the treatment, but also adjust the overall management strategies beyond the um, oil and gas and uh, 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 oil and gas wells and power plants. And of course, there's critical mineral recovery, which is also very uh, uh, very much tied in with produced water characterization and treatment. Um, so, so far, we have three primary um, project tasks that we're focus on, focusing on, lowering the cost of zero liquid discharge and resource recovery, um, compiling full detailed aqueous speciation and mineral saturation indices of produced waters across the United States, as well as leveraging the DOE's produced water optimization framework for rare earth elements and or critical minerals from produced water. And so, you know, these go from supporting basic science to on the ground operations for operators um, and everything in between. Uh, next slide, please. And very recently, um, we've announced a partial um, award selection for FOA 2796 um, last December the water research and development for oil and gas produce water and coal combustion residuals, wastewater associated with coal power plants. Um, and these projects give you an idea of what, where we've been focusing. Uh, topics are as diverse as um, desalinated produced water um, as an irrigation source for non-edible crops, um, as well as um, a source for uh, ammonia mining and carbon sequestration. Um, and we've also, uh, we're also looking at not only uh, the treated water, but also the the, the reject brine streams. Um, and there has been a, a company that uh, won an award, PVT Clean Energy, which which actually uses the reject uh, reject brines, which has been uh, a major disposal issue. 
um, to have it as a uh, material for the uh, development of ultra weight composite uh, uh, manufacturing. So that that's a it's a very unique project. I believe one of the first of its kind to actually um, deal with the the waste stream itself, and not just the actual treatment of the waters. And of course, we have the characterization efforts that make in situ characterization more feasible. Uh, again, the goal is really uh, improving our understanding of the known unknowns. Um, and this this um, goes into both the environmental impacts as well as the economic potential for those waste streams, as far as critical minerals are. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I mentioned about the brine extraction and storage uh, test site. So uh, th this test site has been um, a critical enabler uh, for um, uh, for technology development and advancement <clears throat> and across different types of wastewaters and um, with different technologies. Um, so as you can see to the right, we've we have quite a diverse array of technologies we've tested, um, all of which are plugged into an existing pretreatment uh, system. Uh, th this uh, best site was actually a commercial saltwater saltwater disposal well repurposed um, uh, for carbon capture and storage. And after we completed the carbon capture storage project, we repurposed it uh, for uh, treating power plant effluent, which we shipped over, um, and then produced water, uh, which we also ship over from across the country. Um, we are currently testing waters there um, from the Permian, from the Eagle Four, from the Bakken. And after treatment, we take the samples um, and then we do further chemical and biological um, characterization of those treated samples um, and then uh, upload the data to the NEWS database for the public to use. Um, and, you know, we've tested everything from supercritical water desalination, uh, uh, supercritical water desalination to zeolite dewatering. Um, and this, you know, allows us to simulate produced water chemistry and salinity from diverse geologic basins across the U.S. Um, for my last slide, um, we have, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, could you click again? I think there is, yes, um, I think there are two more bullets. Thank you, perfect. So, um, as I mentioned before, we've, uh, we've been focusing a lot on big data. This is a very recent tool we have developed. Um, it complements the National Energy and Water Treatment uh, Speciation Database I mentioned earlier. Um, it's uh, called CODART, the Constituent Data Replacement Tool, and this helps complete composition data profiles for aqueous wastewater feedstocks. And this um, allows operators um, to develop uh, treatment and recovery process models. And as you can see to the right, you can choose the different uh, machine learning models based um, on your knowledge of the data. Um, and this comes with, an, with a guide uh, once it becomes public um, to um, you know, advise on what the uh, the best models to use based on the data. So, you know, we have random forests, for example. Um, you know, we have uh, multi-layer perceptron models, um, et cetera. And this tool can use the user's data alone or combine user data with other uh, data sources. Um, uh, and we have um, another uh, model, uh, we have other model development uh, specifically for synthetic da data generation. Um, and again, all, the intention of this is to provide that high quality data to enable um, some of the modeling efforts that uh, were, were, were uh, talked about in the previous panel. Uh, so I, I was, uh, I don't probably over time. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Um, be happy to take any questions. And of course, uh, please feel free to, um, you know, uh, check out our tools. They're available for the public. Um, and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Hick. And we don't have time for questions right now. We need to move on of to course. the next 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 presentation, um, which will be um, Alex uh, Priskachev. Uh, Alex is a program manager in the Department of Energy Geothermal Technologies office. And Alex, you've got about 10 minutes. Thanks. Unmute. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Doug, for that uh, intro. As Doug mentioned, I'm Alex Priestyshev. I'm with the Department of Energy Geothermal Technologies Office. Um, I'm an engineer, and I, I oversee and, and help manage our critical materials portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to go through gen a brief overview of our uh, office for those that aren't familiar with it. We have four main uh, focus um, research areas that we focus on. One being an enhanced geothermal system. So this is where we're looking at uh, hot uh, reservoirs 
um, that might not have fluid or uh, active uh, fractures or open fractures. Um, and so we're drilling into those and potentially creating those fracture systems and using uh, different types of, of fluid to extract heat from there. Um, our hydrothermal resources uh, is where kind of traditional geothermal sits. We're looking at hot uh, waters and steam that are coming up and we're producing power from those. This is where also our, our critical materials portfolio sits um, and looking at the co-production between uh, geothermal energy and extraction of critical mi minerals from uh, geothermal brines. And then we have our low temperature resources where we're looking at um, lower temperature uh, fluids that we can use for uh, direct uh, use purposes or uh, introducing those uh, fluids or, or ground temperatures to uh, geothermal heat pumps for heating and cooling purposes. And then we also have our data modeling analysis group. Um, and so all of these research areas are, are looking to uh, increase all geothermal energy deployment through R&D and demonstration of innovative technologies. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so when we look at um, areas where we can um, both produce geothermal power as well as uh, economic amounts of critical materials, this is, um, this is a, a rare ask. And so uh, through the hydrothermal uh, portfolio, we are, we've funded and currently funding um, an opportunity that looks to um, locate these areas of geothermal potential or, or areas that are currently uh, producing uh, geothermal energy like uh, in the Salton Sea, Imperial Valley, California, um, or areas that aren't producing uh, power currently but have a huge critical material and lithium potential like uh, the smackover formation. Next slide, please. Um, again, for those that might not be familiar uh, with what I'm talking about when I mentioned co-production, um, this is a, a little bit of a cartoon of, of what we're talking about. So um, as all of our presenters have mentioned today, geothermal brines um, may contain uh, a, a long list of dissolved solids and minerals that are, are valuable resources like and critical materials like lithium. Um, and so what's happening in general, the um, geothermal brine is being pumped to the surface and it is being sent off to either power production or we can extract that mineral and send it off to our direct uh, mineral extraction processes uh, that a few of our presenters have mentioned and I'll go in a little bit more detail what that is. Um, and we can extract that lithium or, or critical material directly from the brine. And then that spent brine is then sent back into our reservoir where it's reheated and, and minerals could be uh, redissolved in that, in that brine and, and the process repeats itself. Um, and then uh, we can look to um, produce lithium chloride, battery grade, lithium hydroxide and, and other uses uh, for critical min minerals. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the presenters today, Pat Dobson, uh, led the work um, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, along with um, his other project um, team members. Uh, one of the things that we've funded uh, in, in the recent past here is a lithium quantification report of the Salton Sea, where um, Pat and his team looked at quantifying the amount of lithium um, in, the, the, in the Salton Sea known geothermal resource area understanding the mechanisms in which actually allows lithium to be um, in an abundant amount in the geothermal um, brine and uh, understanding the potential environmental impact, how the extraction of lithium um, from these brines would impact air quality, uh, induced seismicity and other factors um, to take into consideration uh, in, in the area and then also conducted uh, a huge amount of uh, community outreach to inform the community on uh, not only geothermal power, but also what, uh, how lithium extraction in the Salton Sea will, um, will would happen, what are the outlooks on that, and really just trying to inform the community and arm them with, with information that they would need to um, better educate themselves on what's going on. Um, the results of this report and, and this research are, as you can see on the slide, were outstanding. Uh, Pat and his team discovered that there's the potential for more than 375 uh, the equivalent lithium equivalent of more than 375 million electric vehicle batteries. 
which exceeds all current um, electric vehicles on the road today in the United States. Um, and accessing this resource would enable the U.S. to meet or exceed this global demand um, of lithium for decades to come. Um, and then just sort of what does that mean currently as we look to uh, produce geothermal power with lithium? Currently within the Salton Sea, there's about approximately 400 megawatts of geothermal um, electricity currently produced. But the entirety of the known geothermal resource area of the Salton Sea has the potential to produce somewhere almost uh, 3,000 uh, megawatts of power, which uh, equiv which means it uh, could produce 375 million um, EV. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I want to mention one thing on uh, going back to the slide. If you want more information on, on Pat's work there, um, there's the eScholar.org website you can visit to, to see the report um, in its entirety. Thanks. Next slide. Um, one of the current funding opportunities we have right now, we have ongoing work, um, is a joint funding opportunity with our partners uh, um, at the Advanced Manufacturing and Material Technologies Office. Um, uh, this is a FOA. We have uh, two topic areas two projects um, under topic area one, looking at demonstration scale of direct lithium extraction. And um, under topic area two, we have, uh, or I think it was about eight projects looking at um, R&D on uh, direct lithium extraction and direct mineral extraction uh, technologies. Um, and so the goal of this goal is to ena enable environmental and social uh, responsible manufacturing of battery grade lithium hydroxide from geothermal brines, not only in the Salt Sea, I should mention, but across the United States. Um, diversify the supply of lithium hydroxide, um, validate these in demonstration facilities, as I mentioned in topic area one, and um, in topic area two, looking to mature um, uh, direct lithium extraction technologies. Um, so these projects have kicked off uh, this year. Some are still being negotiated, um, but there should be uh, some projects are making great progress already, um, and we should look for results on these projects somewhere in the in the year to come. Next slide, please. All right, this is um, an exciting uh, opportunity. We have, we've just announced it. Um, we have a critical materials lab call um, funding opportunity that we have open currently. Applications, as you can see there on the screen, are due May 31st, which is an extension to our original um, original ask. So there's still plenty of time, I hope, for, for those interested in applying. Um, again, a lab call is for those working at national labs to uh, apply as, as lead. And then um, we are uh, encouraging our lab partners to look to industry, states, and, and other academia to, to partner with on, on this. Um, and if you want more information, the, the website is there on the screen, or you can just uh, visit our the Geothermal Technology Office website for more information on that. Um, but in general, uh, the lab call, we have the goals for the lab call are to investigate ways to access and maximize the extraction of lithium and other critical materials from geothermal brines, and also looking to diversify the domestic supply of critical materials from geothermal and oil and gas reservoirs. So in this lab call, we have three uh, topic areas. One is looking at a salt and sea geochemical and thermodynamic database development. So going back to the, the previous panel talking about um, figuring out the mechanisms in which lithium and other critical materials are present in brine. So we're looking to develop a database of geochemical and thermodynamic properties of typical salt and sea and other geothermal uh, reservoir rock to better understand those mechanisms. Um, our topic area two is looking at how we can um, access, increase access and maximize uh, production of these geothermal uh, brines in sometimes very hot um, super, or up to super critical conditions. And so we are asking under that topic area for, for teams to identify uh, baseline materials needed to successfully operate in those uh, sometimes super critical conditions. 
Um, and then our topic area three, we actually had two subtopic areas under this um, ask. So our first topic area and um, overall this topic area, we're following the, the basic framework of what Pat and his team have accomplished um, at the Salton Sea. Um, so topic area three A, we're looking at characterization of lithium or other critical materials um, of the smackover geothermal uh, resource area. Um, and then also subtopic area 3B, we're looking at characterization of lithium or other critical materials um, or minerals um, across the U.S. Uh, places like um, the, the Salt Lake, um, Alaska, including Alaska, um, Hawaii, other places that might have potential that's not currently um, being utilized um, and including oil and gas stations. So I, I'm, um, I didn't mention here on the slide, but we are partnering with um, our friends at uh, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management under this topic area. So we're very interested in the lithium potential um, in oil and gas stations, and as well as uh, again with our, our fo uh, folks at AMTO looking at um, additional geothermal uh, resources. So again, applications would be May 31st. If you want more information, you can reach out to um, um, you go to the I should say go to the the link there, and there's a uh, email address. Um, you can get more information or reach out. Alex, uh, thanks very much. Oh, okay, great. Yep, Alex, we need to move on. No worries. So, Thank you. Oh, okay, um, and you'll have access to these slides to or for the follow up and to follow up with Alex on on some of this. Okay, our final talk, final talk here is going to be by uh, Dr. Hendrada Ali uh, at NSF. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you. So my name is Hendrata Ali. I am a program director with the Division of Earth Sciences. My primary program is the Hydrologic Sciences Program. And so um, I will talk to you today about the opportunities and investment that are at NSF that are related to critical mineral resources from primes. So before I start, I think I would like to summarize a few of the things that I heard today that are of relevance to, to this topic and for some of the programs that I will talk to you about at NSF. So the first thing I noted was that lithium was the big topic today and if we had time to go into the, some of the examples of funded projects, you'd see that lithium is also some of the, the, the critical mineral that is mostly proposed on recently, at least. Climate change. Climate change trends are important for the sustainability and the recharge of brine formations. Um, I heard that hydrologic controls and processes are important for lithium resources. There's a need for geophysical surveys, large scale, um, low, low and high temperature geochemistry um, are important um, to be considered and environmental impact and also um, the biological and economic factors are also important. And so you would see when I talk to you about some of the opportunities that exist at NSF that you could actually identify all of these different areas that come into, into play. So um, can we go to the next slide, please? So the, the first thing is that although there are currently no um, programs at NSF that specifically um, are focused on research on this topic of critical minerals in brines, there are many opportunities that could be receptive to research proposals on this topic across NSF. And you have um, opportunities that exist for unsolicited projects or proposals that can be submitted directly to disciplinary um, programs, cross-cutting or interdisciplinary programs, if the topic aligns with the solicitations of the programs. So um, you could find programs in the Directorate for Geosciences, in engineering, um, the new Directorate Technology Innovation and Partnerships, and Directorate for mat Mathematical and um, Physical Sciences, but also um, Social um, and Economic and Behavioral Sciences at NSF. 
So, for example, I think if you talk, um, come to the director for geosciences, specifically in programs in marine geology and geophysics, petrology and um, geochemistry, geobiology and low temperature geochemistry, of course, um, hydrologic sciences, chemical oceanography, all these programs and many others would welcome proposals on this topic if, if it aligns with the program solicitation. In addition to um, unsolicited proposals, you could also submit proposals to um, that are responsive to special calls um, and that are themed around critical mineral research. So these could be either through diacolic letters that have been released, or they could be through um, new programs with specific program solicitations. So next slide. So here um, I want to talk about dear colleague letters, and you could um, use a QR code to access some of the a couple of the dear colleague letters on there, and you could use the program number and go to the NSF website. I'd have the code at the end where you could also search these programs. So the build a resilient planet um, highlights some of the priority research areas in the Directorate for Geosciences. And one of these um, has a dear colleague letter on novel approaches to critical mineral research in the geosciences, which is a DCL that was released last year. And we've received um, and already um, awarded some awards on this case. If we had time at the end, maybe I would talk about some of the awarded projects. So this DCL calls for proposals to support research for the discovery, the characterization, extraction, and separation of critical minerals, which is, of course, important to the topic we're discussing today. Another dear colleague letter is um, the critical aspects of sustainability that spans several programs and divisions um, across directorates at NSF. And this DCL is for programs that seek to support basic research through a core disciplinary program to improve the sustainability of resources while maintaining or improving current products. So a couple of DCLs in this group would be the critical aspect of sustainability in innovation solutions to sustainable chemistry. And um, this is through the Directorate for Mathematical and Physical Sciences um, for research that um, aims to improve the understanding of processes, efficiencies, separation science, manufacturing processes at scale, and also the upcycling and recycling of materials and chemicals, including critical minerals. The, the second um, DCL related to the critical aspect of sustainability is um, the critical aspect of sustainability in innovative solutions to climate change from the Directorate for Geosciences. And this DCL is a call that is intended um, for action that encourages the submission of proposals to answer fundamental questions related to novel approaches and solutions to climate change. Um, potential um, for topics include innovation in technologies for desalination, developing and innovating for uh, environmentally benign methods for the sustainable exploration, exploitation, utilization of critical minerals and geomaterials that are relevant to clean energy systems. So again, this kind of touches on some of the things that were discussed today and maybe that the last panel was talking about in terms of what are some of the, the needs for research in, in on this topic. Just my notes. A third DCL that we can talk about is about innovative use of scientific collections. That is a multi-program in directorates across NSF, and the DCL encourages proposals that foster innovation and diverse use of collections and digital data for novel research, education, and training. And it offers opportunities to explore the use of collections and digital data in several areas of geosciences, including critical minerals and sustainable research. So that's another DCL that you could um, I look at, and then we have the clean energy technology research advanced by interdisciplinary science and engineering and the early concept grants for exploratory research, also known as RAISE and EGERS. 
and the DCL aims to support scientists to develop potentially transformative convergent fundamental research proposals in clean energy um, technologies. And then we have the Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering Materials, DCL. Next slide. In addition to DCLs, we have um, cross-cutting interdisciplinary programs and special solicitations, and you have a number of them on the screen. So you have the environmental convergence opportunities in chemical and bioengineering environmental and transport systems called ecoseabed. We have the convergence, um, green convergence research, um, national convergence accelerator program, which was um, launched with the TIP directorate, Designing Materials to Revolutionize and Engineer Our Future, which is a multi-agency initiative. Um, we also have an NSF DOE partnership, NSF Small Business Innovation Research, and Small Business Technology Transfer, and the Industry University Cooperative Research Centers programs. So all of these opportunities are receptive to proposals that touch on the topic of critical minerals research and whether it is in Brian or otherwise. Thank you. Got it. Thanks. That's a lot of programs to uh, to be thinking about and considering. Um, thanks all. Um, this has been a really, really good conversation, and I know it's going to continue um, uh, in, amongst this community. Um, want to thank all the speakers who came from away. Uh, to join us here as well as everybody who signed on. Um, we'll note that we had about 450 registrants overall, a couple hundred or over a couple hundred folks who were online and a lot of who you know, hung in there with us all the way through. 